Are you all ready for the word? Amen. Um, I feel suitable um, to speak to you from this subject um, because my life has been uh, full, full of, how can I say, unexpected circumstances. And I've had to learn how to do this even when I don't feel like it. And I want to speak to you today from this subject entitled Stay the Course. Stay the course. I want you to encourage the person next to you to tell them, stay the course, stay the course. Stay the course. I am going to uh, read from the book of Acts, chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20, uh, verses 1 through 16. I understand that y'all have been um, in this series entitled, Finish the Mission. Uh, can't stop, won't stop. Hashtag, can't stop, won't stop. And so um, I want to, um, I've been instructed to make sure I stay along those lines, and, and I want to make sure that I'm obedient. Amen? Amen. Amen. That way I may, I may get a chance to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Acts chapter number 20, we'll begin at verse number 1, and um, once you have it, shout I have it. If you don't have it, that's all right. Take advantage of technology that I think they're going to have it on the screen for you. And this is what it begins to read, when the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through the area, through, through that area, speaking many words of encouragement uh, to people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some of the Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. Y'all, I just, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce those words, but I think that was a good gift. Say amen. <laughs> Verse 5, these men went on ahead and waited for us at Tre Tros, but we sailed from Philippi after the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And five days later, we joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Verse 7 On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Chuck advised me as long as I get you all out before midnight, we're going to be all right. <laughs> Verse 8, there were many lambs in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Verse 9, seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. While he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down and threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asios, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Exos, he, we took him aboard and went on to my title. The next day we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos. The following day, arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, where he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. Can you say amen? amen? I want to speak to you again from this subject. Stay the course. Mosaic, ladies and gentlemen, family, I, I want to begin this teaching uh, by Paul in the room with this question. Have you ever just woke up and realized just how blessed you really are? I mean, think about it. Have you ever just woke up and, and, and realized just how blessed you are? Because you do know that the 
truth of the matter is, no matter how rough things may be in life right now, all of us in here are still blessed. Yeah, there, there, there are many reasons as to why uh, we would come to this consensus as to why we are, are blessed. Some of us can testify that we are blessed because we have our health and we have our strength. And, and some of us would cooperate that we are blessed because we have our peace. Lord, I know that's a blessing. We have our peace and we are in our right mind. Other of, us, others of us would say, Pastor Charles, I can't lie to you, man. Things aren't all necessarily all good. They aren't favorable for me. They're not going in the direction uh, that I want them to go. But when I look at my family, I'm still, I, I am a, a witness that even though it's not all good, it's still all God. I know that I am blessed. Mosaic, I woke up this morning with the same testimony. Thanking God and thinking about just how blessed I really am. Out of my health, uh, I'm in my right mind, and I have a beautiful family. I've been married to my beautiful wife for 13 years. And we have three children. I have my 19-year-old daughter, Sierra, my middle child, Kiera, who's 11, and I have my youngest son, Bryson, who was six years old. And all of them, parents know this, all of them have their own personality. Bryson, he is a Bruce Lee watcher. Jet Lee lover. Self-proclaimed ninja. They love watching Chad Wild Clay all day long on YouTube. My oldest daughter, she's quiet. She's spicy. She's very cunning. And my middle child, she's the artsy one. Kiara, she's real creative. And she's fearless. Kiara is the one that would rather say what's on her mind and face the consequences later than keep quiet about how she felt. She's fearless, but I do remember a time when Kiara wasn't that way. In fact, Kiara was the exact opposite. She was very fearful. Now, I remember this particular um, time when I was teaching her how to ride her bike, and she was so scared, and the truth is, I'm going to be honest with you parents, you know, she made me scared too. <laughs> you know, every time, every time that she would fall, she would acquire a bump or a scratch or a scrape. And every time that she would fall, and because of that, she would just be that much more afraid. And so every time, even if it looked like there was some type of potential obstruction in her way. It caused, uh, my daughter Kiara, we call it Kiki, it caused Kiki to just freeze up and stop pedaling. I mean, anytime it even looked as if she was facing opposition or looked as if she was facing danger, she would just stop pedaling. Loose ground, she would just stop pedaling. Potholes, she would just stop pedaling. Any, anything that could possibly cause her danger demotivated her on her journey and her mission to successfully ride her bike. And I had to eventually tell her, Kiki, the key to overcoming fear was not to stop pedaling. Actually, the key to overcoming your fear was the exact opposite. It wasn't to stop pedaling, but, but rather it was to keep pedaling. Kiki had a mission, and the key to Kiara accomplishing her mission was to keep on pedaling, not to stop at obstacles. Was to keep pedaling, not, not to stop at potholes. It was to keep pedaling, and I would tell her, I'd say, Kiara, see, when you fall, everybody, it doesn't matter how great of a bike rider you are, everybody falls sometimes. And I would tell her, Kiara, when you fall, don't just stay there on the ground and settle in the fact that you have failed, but get back up and start pedaling again. Get back up with some type of fight on the inside of you that refuses to let potholes and bumps and scrapes and, and, and things that don't necessarily go in the way you want to go. Refuse to let that stop you from accomplishing your mission. And likewise, I want to tell you this morning, Mosaic that in your life you're going to experience bumps in the road. You got to face danger. You will run into potholes. And along the way, you'll get bruised. 
Yeah, along the way, you'll you're, you're get scraped, but, but you will have to be like the prophet Isaiah and declare that no weapons formed against me shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, God shall condemn. Can you say amen? Yeah. You see, this is what I learned. Fear is a crippler. Yeah, fear is a crippler. It is a paralyzer to your God-given talents. Fear is a paralyzer to your God-ordained destiny. So you're asking, okay, well, PC, Pastor Charles, how do you become fearless in your mission? How do you stay the course and remain mission-minded? Well, I want to first make sure that we have a working definition and understand what I mean when I say stay the course. See, stay the course is a phrase. It's, it's used in the context of war. Um, it's a phrase that's used in the context of a, a, a battle, meaning to pursue a goal. Whatever your goal is, it means to pursue a goal regardless of any obstacles and regardless of any criticism. Stay the course. Pursue your goals regardless of any obstacles and regardless of any criticism. Now, you can't do that just with willpower. You cannot do that just with willpower. You need why power. You need why power. So my first point is, the why is always greater than the what. I'm going to say that again. The why is greater than the what. You see, Paul, who we read about in Acts chapter 20, was once a man, for those of you who uh, know his story, I will remind you, for those of you who don't know his story, I'm going to um, give you some insight. Paul um, used to be a, a man named Saul. And Saul persecuted Christians, and one day, uh, Saul asked uh, permission from the high priest if he could just receive letters to go into Damascus uh, and, and to go uh, that way along that particular journey. And he asked for permission that if he ran into any devoted followers of the way, because the way is what Christianity used to be called. It was the way. And how many know, if, even though the way is what it used to be called, the way Christianity Christianity is still the way. Amen. It is still the way. It used to be called the way. He says, now give me permission to, if I find anyone who is a follower of the way, to lock them up and take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem with me. And he receives what he needs and Saul is on his way to Damascus. And while he's on his way, God strikes him with a, a, a very bright light and blinds him. This light comes down from heaven and blinds him, and God begins to speak to him concerning what he had been doing at Saul. He gives him instructions. He says, go into the city, and, and, and Saul goes there and, stay, and stays there, not eating, uh, not drinking for three days until a man named Ananias comes, lays hands on him, because that's what the Lord instructed Ananias to do, lays hands on him, and after doing so, um, the scriptures teach us that the scales on Saul's eyes fell off, and he was no longer blind. After that, he began his journey as Paul. He got up, he was baptized, and he began preaching in synagogues. From that point on, Paul knew his wife. Now that's important because that's the fuel that allows us on, in hindsight to be able to see what we see now from Paul. He had an encounter with Jesus. He, he knows his why. And when did his why resonate with him? It resonated with him after a major encounter with Jesus. Lord, if I only had the time, I don't have time to deal with this, but I want to just throw this out there. Let me call, stop, set up shop real quick right here. I want you to know that transformation always happens when we have a real encounter with Jesus. That when you have an encounter with Jesus, your life will never be the same. There is always some type of transformation that happens when you have a real encounter with Jesus. Paul's wife, from that point on, was to devote himself to the preaching of the gospel. The calling on Paul's life was that of an apostle. He was to testify that Jesus was the Messiah. You've heard it this way before. Where there is a wheel, there is a way, right? 
And I agree, but I do want to argue that you need more than just a week. <laughs> that that's not incorrect, but it is incomplete. You need uh, not just willpower to finish the mission that God has placed on your life. You need wild power. You need wild power to stay the course. You need wild power. My question to you is, what is your why? But like, what is your reason? What, what, what's your why? What, what fuels your passion? What fuels your faith? Is it just to say I go to church Sunday after Sunday? We, we just have big church services? What, what's, what's your why? Because that's the very thing that you cannot afford to lose. No matter how rough it is, I don't care how tough it is, you cannot lose your why. What's your why? That's the thing that's worth fighting for. It's your why. But it's also the thing that the enemy is trying to snatch away from you. The adversary wants to steal your why. Because why power is always greater than willpower. And why power is greater than the what. See, there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of things who have not a concrete reason as to why they're doing it. So it's not about the what. And there are a lot of people that wake up with all of the fervor, strength, and energy they need every day, but it isn't sustained. Because why is greater than we? Why is greater than what? Paul knew his why. And his why sustains him through obstacles and through the potholes of life. His wife says, hey, I'm going to do even his past, which brings me to point number two. See, it's in your why that you'll find out who you are and what you're called to do. It's in your why. Paul had his why, and because of that, he started preaching almost immediately, and he didn't let anything stop him not even himself. Point number two, in order to stay the course, don't allow your past to paralyze your progress. Oh, I want to say that one more time. Don't allow your past to paralyze your progress. You see, God, he did not, God doesn't want you spending all your time in regret. Because remaining in regret allows the enemy to rob you of a code. Lord, I'm going to say, oh, I felt that. I feel like this. I'm sorry. I had to do it. Okay. Remaining in regret causes and allows the enemy to rob you of recovery. And you'll be amazed at how much you could accomplish by simply getting over your past. Yeah, because oftentimes we are harder on ourselves than anybody else could ever be. And everybody knew that Paul had a reputation. Paul had a reputation that preceded him. They talked about Paul before he even came into the city. When they would hear about it, they were, they were wondering if Paul was actually changed. When, when, they, when they, they thought Saul was coming to persecute them, when they would hear about Paul, his past preceded him. And, and once he had an authentic encounter with Jesus and began his ministry, people had a hard time believing that Paul was actually changed. Let's go to Acts chapter number 9, verses number 20 through 25. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9, verse 20 through 25. This proves my claim. The Bible, this is what it reads, that once he began to preach in the synagogues. Preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all of those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised heaven in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And after many days he had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Paul, excuse me, but Saul learned of their plan. They 
and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Y'all just see what just happened? Paul's life has changed. He begins preaching that the Son, that Jesus, the Son of God, is the Messiah. And those that are familiar with him as Saul has heard the things that he said. And they're astonished and they're surprised that here is a man that has went from persecuting Jesus to now preaching Jesus. But here it is, here's the twist in the text. Instead of being happy for him and rejoicing with him, they get so mad that they conspire to kill him. And what does Paul do? He could have snapped back. He could have clapped back. <laughs> Paul did, he handled it in a different way. He could have handled it as he always has known, because you know, this is this is Saul. He could have handled it as he'd always known. He could have complained to God. Because I'm a new Christian. <laughs> and use it as an excuse to deny his faith. He could have said, man, everything was going good for me, and it didn't even seem like it was rough until I started following you, God. <laughs> I had everything in order, and it seems like I had my plan, I was going, everything was well, until I started following you, God. But he didn't allow his past to paralyze his progress. And as a result, God made a way of escape. Did he have foes? Yeah, he had foes. But he also had followers. And sometimes I believe that we're so focused on our foes that we fail to recognize our followers. Sometimes you can be so focused on the haters that you don't realize who God placed in your circle to encourage you and to keep you along the way. He has followers, but he also has followers. And likewise, you may have followers, but you also have followers. And there are some people who can't stand the fact that you have decided that your 2019 will not be like your 2018. There are some people who cannot stand the fact that you have decided in your mind that you will be changed and changed for real this time. But this is what I learned. You don't need everybody to like you. You don't need everybody to like you. All you need is the right ones to like you. Amen. He, he, he didn't just, he didn't let his past stop him and paralyze his progress. And it was actually the church's past that God used to prepare him for his time. I want to tell you, your past has prepared you for your right now. And your present is preparing you for your future. I said your past has prepared you for your right now. And your present is preparing you for your future. I'm almost done, but somebody shout, I've been trained for this. <laughs> Y'all didn't say it like you mean it. Somebody shout, I've been trained for this. <laughs> it may be tough, it may be rough, but I've been trained for this. The past didn't kill you. It was training, prerequisite for where you are right now. Then lastly, point number three. How do I stay the course? I have the understanding that opposition is an enemy. Opposition is an enemy. All throughout Paul's tenure in ministry, he faced opposition. During his missionary journey, Paul faced opposition. He's Y'all read that part, right? He's, he's preaching in Damascus and the Jews plot to kill him, but he escapes by he's, he, he escapes by being lowered uh, through the wall in a basket. And then Paul is sent back to Tarsus, and eventually Paul ends up in a place called Antioch with a man named Barnabas. He ends up in a place called Antioch with Barnabas, and they start doing ministry together. 
And while Paul uh, starts preaching in, at Antioch, and he preaches from Antioch on to Iconium, and people start getting upset there because Paul is following the leading of the Lord, and they begin to plot that they want to stone Paul, and they want to kill Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas hear about it, and they flee the city. They end up in a place called Lystra, and Paul speaks to a lame man. Uh, he speaks healing to a lame man there, and the man immediately stands up and starts walking. And the people, instead of rejoicing, they get upset. Excuse me, instead of rejoicing about the, uh, the God in heaven, they start calling Paul and Barnabas God. They said, man, these people, they, they credit the healing to Paul and Barnabas. And Paul runs out into the middle of the crowd and says, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. You got it twisted. We are humans just like you are. And while Paul is explaining to the crowd, while he's explaining to the Jews, while he's explaining to the crowd that they are not gods, that they are human, guess what happens? The Jews from Antioch and Iconium, the place where they had left, the Jews there who wanted to kill them there, ends up showing up. And they win the crowd over. And they end up stoning Paul and leaving him for dead. The Bible says that he had people that helped him up and brought him back into the city. He got back on his feet. And then Paul and Barnabas ends up returning back to Antioch. This was, Paul's life always was amazing to me. Because he always returned back to the place where he received some of the most criticism. Mm -hmm. Returns back to Antioch, and then him and Barnabas have a disagreement. They have a disagreement on who they should take to their next missionary journey. And they have such a sharp disagreement that they end up splitting up. So not only has he been stoned, not only has he been beaten up, but now the one who has been with him since the beginning of his preaching ministry has now left. But Paul understood that opposition is enough. Starts his second missionary journey with Silas, then eventually Timothy joins him. They end up in a place called Troas, and there Paul receives this vision of a man in Macedonia crying out and saying, "Man, please come help us." So they figure that's God speaking to them. And that's their next assignment. And along the way, they cast out a spirit of a slave in Philippi. And because she's now delivered, she's no longer making money for her slave masters through what she did uh, was called fortune telling. And she no longer made money because now she's delivered. There she's delivered. And they get, her slave masters get so upset that she can no longer make money for them because her life has now changed that they actually seize Paul and Silas. They take them, they take them to the authorities, and they stated that they were causing too many issues in practicing laws that was unlawful for Romans to follow. So they stripped them and they beat them and they threw them in jail. Now Paul and Silas is in jail. But Paul understands that opposition is inevitable. And he and Silas starts praying and singing songs to God while they're in jail. Physical body locked up but their mind is free. And they're praying, and they're praying to God, and while they're doing so, the other prisoners start hearing them praying, and hearing them praising, and they start getting encouraged, and suddenly there is a mighty earthquake that happens, and the scriptures teach us that the foundation of the prison was so shaken that it shook off everything that was holding Paul and Silas captive. And I'm going to tell somebody this morning that whether you believe it or not, prayer and pray is such a powerful tool. Prayer and pray is such a powerful tool that when you pray and when you praise God, God has a way of freeing you of everything that's trying to keep you back. Not only did Paul inside the jail sales me over. Not only did their chains fall off, but the scriptures teach us that all of the prisoners' doors flew over this way. And the prisoners changed You know, God has a way that when you pray, that's where well free and you and free and those you connect to the way. When you pray and when you pray, God has a way of causing stuff to fall off of you and stuff to fall off of people you're praying for as well. They get free, but the prisoners understand. 
understands that he has been, and he's been given, the, he, he's been given responsibility of these prisoners. And if they go free, that means his life has to be traded for theirs. So he falls to his knees, knowing uh, the fate of his life, and gets ready to commit suicide. And when he gets ready to commit suicide, Paul screams out to him and says, "No, brother, hold on, don't do it. We are still here." And the man is so astonished that he falls to his knees and cries out, saying, how must I be saved? Because free people, free people. Yeah. 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 Free people, free people. And when you're free, you have a way of managing unfavorable circumstances in a way that other people came in. Yeah. Everybody yeah. asked and took off. Oh, we found it free. But Paul didn't realize it, we, were, we were never bound by, by the uh, by jail cells anyway. The doors swinging open. We were free before the doors swing open. Yeah. And they stayed focused on the other side. Still stayed in the course. And what Paul and Silas teaches us, church, is how to be missionary. How to have the mentality that I can't stop, and I won't stop. That opposition is just an opportunity for God to show his power. Right. And that's why in the midst of opposition, I don't give up and throw his hand. But in the midst of opposition, I pray and I praise. As Joe is converted, he becomes a follower of Jesus. Paul is released. And it teaches me that the freedom, that your freedom is a is tied into your ability to finish the mission and stay the course. I'm going to close with this and the man can come back I'm up at this time. But I want to close with this. Paul starts his third missionary journey. When he starts his third missionary journey, that's kind of where our story falls into place. What has happened is you know, Paul has now preached all into Ephesus. While he's preaching in Ephesus, he starts preaching that gods made by man's hands are not gods at all. <laughs> God's made by man's hands are not God's at all. And there's a silversmith there by the name of Demetrius. And Demetrius realizes that I'm a silversmith and what I, the things that I make is uh, these, <laughs> these idols, these things that look like the God that we uh, serve, they are this. And if this man is preaching that God made uh, the, man's, the hands of man, is not a God at all. And that's actually about to mess up my business. <laughs> and so what Demetrius does is call all of the business owners. Call all of the business owners together. And he says, now look, there's a man named Paul. You've been hearing about him. And he's preaching that these gods are made by men and demons are not gods at all. And you know what's going to cause us to have a deficit in our pockets. Because <laughs> that's going to cause us to lose money. And the Bible says there's this huge uproar. Here's this huge uproar in the city. And then about Paul ends up, Paul has a vision that he needs to go back to Jerusalem. So Paul, he's on his journey in, and they end up writing two of Paul's followers. And they see him and take him before the city. And the, the, the city clerk goes before the people and says, hey, now listen, we have no accusation, no accusations against these two men. You got to either press charges against them now, or you're going to have to let them know. And they want to talk. They weren't worried about those two men. And so eventually they let those two men go. And Paul's friend, Paul, who is a warrior, wants to go and rescue his friend, but his, his friend, he wants to go and rescue his father, but his friends are like, no, we can't let you go. It's crazy, and that's it. And so Paul waits until the overworld has calmed down. And that's how our text begins in Acts chapter number 20. He waits for this bird words calm down. When he waits for this bird words calm down, he goes and gets his disciples and he starts encouraging them. And then he goes on his journey. While he's on his journey, he starts 
speaking and encouraging those who we know with in Troy as while he's preaching, suddenly, just what Paul needs, somebody falls dead while he's preaching. <laughs> <laughs> he's giving, he's speaking life. And somebody falls dead while he's preaching. Do you know what Paul does? Paul goes down, grabs his arm around him. God uses him. Life comes back in this boy, puts him back in the hands of his caretakers, and says, He is alive. <laughs> and what does Paul do? Paul goes right back to scripture. This is what I realized. Paul understood our position is inevitable. If you just play, play just softly, it's, 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 it's going to happen. And this is what I believe. I believe Paul was able to. I believe Paul was able to keep going because he understood opposition was inevitable, and that helped prepare his mind. He was not cynical. He wasn't pessimistic. He didn't go looking for danger, but he understood that danger could happen. And so I need to make up in my mind that today may not go as planned, but I understand my why. And because I understand my why, I understand that my why was given to me by the one that's in control. And the one that's in control already knows what I'm going to face. So no matter what happens, I'm going to stay the course. Oh, no matter who leaves me, I'm going to stay the course. Like, no matter why I would disagree with I'm going to stay the course. See, this is what I learned. Paul, Paul's life is a blueprint. And sometimes God will allow you to go through what nobody else goes through so that he can prepare you to do what nobody else has done. Amen. Amen. So this is what I want you to hold on to last one. Is that it's bigger than you. Somebody shout that it's bigger than you. See, you can stay the course by realizing that it's bigger than you. Because when Paul was writing the New Testament, Paul did not know that he was writing the New Testament. So Paul's life is being led so that it can be lived. So that we can live a life that's actually lived. In other words, Paul's life was led by the Holy Spirit. And because he stayed mission-minded, because he stayed the course, we are now able to look back over the New Testament and receive encouragement and instruction I just gave you a snapshot of all that happened in Paul's life. Right? I think we all can agree with Paul facing tough situations. But do you know that it's through those journeys that he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? Alright. Yeah. It's through those journeys he wrote Galatians. Things like Galatians 6 and 9, where he writes, let us not come with it will do. For in due season, in the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we faint. It's through those journeys that he writes, Thessalonians 5 and 11. He writes, the Thessalonians, therefore, encourage one another. Yeah. Right. Encourage one another. And heal one another up. Just as in fact, it's through those journeys, all of that opposition that you Right after he's been stoned, right after he realized they want to kill him, where he writes Corinthians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. The Father of compassion. The God of all comfort. Who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any troubles. And the comfort we ourselves receive from God. To those during the day he writes Romans. And we know. Romans 8 and 28. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and the call according to his name. Paul's life is a woman. Sometimes God, sometimes your life, the journey he has you on is one that no one else.